possibility of an AGI explosion where AIs are really interacting with AIs. How this compares to Anthropic's approach, because currently Anthropic's Claude Sonnet 3.5 is a better code coder. It really came from the the point of view of they're just moving so fast. Everything's moving so fast. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Today is Tuesday, July 9th, 2024, and you're watching The Daily AI Show Live. Today, we're talking about using AI to fix AI and specifically OpenAI's critic GPT. With me today uh, is Andy and Junmi, and I'm Beth. Uh, Brian is traveling. We'll let you know if anyone else joins. So as I said, we're going to explore how AI can actually make itself better, faster, and more accurate. And, uh, you know, you might be thinking, what? <laughs> what? How does that even work? Um, so that's exactly what we're going to unpack today. OpenAI, the creators of ChatGPT, published the post on their blog called Finding GPT-4's, GPT-4's Mistakes with GPT-4 while they wrote that and no one had to say it out loud. But here I am saying it out loud. Um, all right. So basically, Critic GPT is designed to help with reinforcement learning from human feedback, which is how uh, which is how these models are trained. And reinforcement learning from human feedback has a fundamental uh, limitation in that the humans need to recognize the errors in order to give the human feedback. And that is what Critic GPT was created to do. And, uh, the evaluation, they published a paper about this too, but basically um, uh, critic GPT plus human found 60% more of the errors, uh, which also included a reduction in hallucination of errors because, uh, a as we know, um, uh, sometimes these models just hallucinate because they think there should be something that they're finding that is the next most right answer. So that's my uh, little intro. Um, uh, who'd like to get us started? Andy, do you have a like little intro for us? Sure. Uh, so let me talk first quickly about what RLHF, or Reinforcement Learning from hum Human Feedback, is. It's a technique that's used to <clears throat> primarily align models output with what humans prefer. Um, because you know, left on its own, unsupervised training of a model by just feeding a lot of data results in the model hallucinating in some cases, but also in some cases just producing outputs or responses to the users that aren't <clears throat> that aren't tuned, if you will, to you know be um, the ones that get the thumbs up from the many millions of users, hundreds of millions of users. Uh, every day of these models. So there's an RLHF pipeline in every major model's um, you know, system operation. So what, what Crate GPT is, that it, what they've done is they've inserted an AI into that labeling pipeline, the labeling process of saying this one's wrong uh, and, and it ought to be improved by doing this. Um, so the the Examples that were provided by OpenAI about how Critic GPT is being used have to do with analysis of the possible mistakes that are in the outputs of code delivered by the code interpreter of OpenAI's model. So they don't use ex expressly an example of just general queries and responses. They're talking about refining uh, <laughs> programming code for coders. And, and so this is an important uh, step, which is to assist because there's there's two two reasons why Critic GPT is important. One is collecting high quality human feedback, uh, especially on coding examples, is expensive and time consuming. You have to hire really expert coders to be able to recognize the errors that are generated in responses in various languages of code. Like think of all you know, you got to have a whole army of human feedback providers, and so it'll be better and better if you can basically provide models that can can do a, a lot of the heavy lifting of that 
analysis of the output. Uh, now, I'll point out that RLHF uh, pipelines already use models. In fact, the way they, they do it is they train a reward model uh, using human feedback, and that reward model is then in the pipeline and is used to provide further feedback to the active model's actual responses that are doing, being done in real time. The other reason this is important is it I see it as part of a progression toward the, the eventual possibility of an AGI explosion where AIs are really interacting with AIs and refining themselves, correcting themselves, and advancing their reasoning capabilities and their knowledge. And I wanted to read a couple of quotes from the uh, sort of the uh, public relations output of Critic GPT from OpenAI. So they're saying this is providing our trainings, trainers with explicit AI assistance in their identification of things, just as Beth said. And this is a, a step towards being able to evaluate outputs, and I quote, from advanced AI systems that can be difficult for people to rate. Okay, so AIs will get more and more sophisticated. It's increasingly, quote, increasingly difficult to train models as they gradually become more knowledgeable than any person that could provide feedback. All right, so this is, this is anticipating a time. Right now, Critic GPT is just being applied to provide assistance to human feedback providers by giving them tips and tricks, just like we might use, right? Oh, here, analyze this this uh, article and give, give me some guidance about, you know, what, you know, is good and bad about it, the pros and cons or whatever. Well, this is being done against code, but eventually you release the model after it's been fully trained, just like the reward model is released to, to provide actions today in the RLHF pipeline. A critic GPT or a more advanced and well-trained model will be released to interact at light speed, if you will, uh, with another AI model and advance its capabilities very dramatically. And, and that's, we're going to talk about this on next Tuesday's show, which is, uh, you know, the uh, Max Tegmark book that, that really uh, lays out a beautiful uh, narrative about how this would actually work in an advanced, artificially general intelligent pair of models working together and multiple models working together to achieve the, you know, incredible uh, capabilities beyond human comprehension in many cases. Right. I'll, I'll stop there. Right. Uh, and so I just want everybody to know Carl has joined. Thanks, Carl. Good morning. Um, so the idea that, um, that, that we're being introduced to that OpenAI is introducing us to the concept of critic GPT also seems to be um, important, right? Like OpenAI does things. OpenAI has said that they're like um, that they're slowly rolling out not just models and improvements, but concepts for us so that people can start to get to understand them. Uh, uh, Jumi, I'm wondering what you think about uh, about Critic GPT and this in that context. So uh, I, <clears throat> so when Sam Altman, you know, talked about uh, doing a slow release, it really came from the the point of view of they're just moving so fast, everything's moving so fast. So this is an effort for OpenAI to. Uh, to allow people to catch up, right? Give that time to like, oh, this is the latest, greatest thing. Okay, cool. We understand this is coming out. All right, now it's out. Now we're going to use it. Now it's going to be part of our, you know, our processes. Okay, as soon as we get it done with our processes, then, then they'll come out with a better version or they'll come out with the next thing. You know, it's, a, it's along that process, right? So the way I see this, and, and Andy kind of uh, touched on this a little bit, is this is that next step. Let's introduce something to our customer base and to people in general that may not necessarily be in the space, um, because this this critic GPT, it's not conceptually new, right? We have had 
code uh, reviewers, we've had code uh, enhancing or summarizing, you know, all, all of these things, just um, auditing uh, code. You know, AWS has theirs, there's GitHub with their co-pilot, all of these kinds of things. So the concept of having AI help people uh, check their code about whatever project they're working on, that's not new. What's, uh, what I think the highlight of this is that this is a model that's supposed to work with people in reviewing its own code that it outputs, right? So that's that's where I think the big difference is. is it is it isn't reviewing human code; it's reviewing the code that other AI models or its other AI models are uh, are creating. Right? And so I, I think that's the key distinction that you got to take out uh, take away from this. Now, of course, uh, while I appreciate the information coming out, uh, I would like to try it now, which, which I can't. Um, and it's supposed to be an internal tool. I understand, but you know, can can I have can I have the kitty version so that I can the Happy Meal version so that that I can give it a shot? You know, just just because I I, I think it's cool and I and I want to try out that you know the, those tools. But I think overall, it's it's a good strategy. Uh, if if your approach is to educate people in general about what kinds of things are coming down the pipeline and help uh, identify what your overall uh, or your holistic view for AGI development, because that's their mission, right? To develop AGI. So mm -hmm. this this helps um, this helps go step by step. Uh, I would love to see a little more timeline wise, but, you know, maybe everyone's not uh, really uh, ready to uh, absorb it on that level. So I'm just so excited. I just I just want more faster. Let's <laughs> and can I try it out? Let's let's see. You know, it's like uh, we're on. I'm on my timeline. Uh, Star Trek needs to happen now, uh, sooner than later. Let's go. <laughs> but yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay. Hey Carl. So what are you seeing in terms of um, in terms of Critic GPT affecting? Um, the kinds of conversations that you're having with clients, like it does that, is that even in the realm of conversation? No, because I think my clients, which I keep mentioning before, are not at that point when it, like you could always mention, hey, OpenAI has this critic GPT that can do, you know, it's designed to, you know, spot errors. And that may give people some comfort. It's interesting. You've got some clients who, you, actually, it's very interesting. One client is using Gemini. Like, it was the very, very first time this person mentioned, she was just mentioning Gemini, actually more focused and using Gemini and um, Bard than Gemini than actually OpenAI. So that was very, it was like, oh, that that's very neat. And then asking questions. Oh, does Chat GPT do the same thing? I was like, how did this? Ha I was like, how, did, how, how did this happen? Like, how did are, how how are you so deep into the Google ecosystem that <laughs> you know, I was like, did did Google birth you? And then <laughs> you know, like, I don't know how. I was like, how did, how did it was very very it was really interesting. Anyway, um, but I do want to pivot though in terms of a critic GPT. And what I was actually trying now, I didn't just think about it, is I wanted either ChatGPT, pro probably Perplexity, or ChatGPT to review that article. And then based on that review, give me instructions on how to build such critic GPT. And then build it for myself. And then see what I can do with it. But the thing is, I don't think I need to do that. Because if that's being built already, and then we have... The next round of models coming up. When will it get to that point where it's just it happens behind the scenes and we don't really we won't notice it? And we have I think all these models have to start training, or if we're going to a future with agents, then then does it really matter? Because they'll be they'll have to look for it, right? Because businesses will need assurances that their agents 
actually makes like are actually working and doing the things that they need to do and interacting our personal agents. And then the companies or vendors who were using the agents or representing our agents are doing the exact same thing. So I think that's where I'm seeing critic GPT, but uh, yeah, that's so kind of where I think it's uh, important to uh, follow your thread on agents because agents are going to be able to take multiple steps, hundreds of steps that of their own generation. They have active, active control over what steps they're going to take. They're not just following instructions. So these more advanced AI models that are agentic can, can be given a high level objective and then they'll develop a plan of action that includes many complex steps including generating code in multiple steps in order to uh, provide to itself in its pursuit of this objective uh, to provide these intermediate uh, outputs. So for the agents of the future, uh, we need to have supervision for this reinforcement learning from human feedback that can understand really long, complex chains generated by agents and say, okay, well, that was a good, good result. Or, you know, Hey, back in step, you know, 73, you know, I, I think you might've gone one way or another. Well, that's beyond the ken of most humans to try to understand that and provide feedback for it. even a, a very advanced programming expert couldn't go through a long agentic chain that involves one model, much less multiple models interacting with each other. So it's really important to train other AIs that are going to have a role in alignment. Okay. And what we mean by alignment is being consistent with human objectives uh, and, and preferences like human interests rather than just the AI's interests. And, and the, you know, the doomsayers of, of which I'm not one, uh, around AI say, okay, you know, these things are going to, you know, talk to each other and they're going to figure something out that's going to end up damaging, you know, human populations in some way, uh, at least not be sufficiently considerate of it. So RLHF is really all about alignment and ultimately super alignment, the gener uh, generations of future models that are really constitutionally designed to be acting in the interest of humans, not just in the interest of a single human or, uh, you know, uh, their, their owners specifically. Um, anyway, so agents definitely, and agents can't be supervised easily by humans looking at their output. So remember, there's two things I want to point out. A couple, several months ago, we were talking about how smaller models, I think, were needed to monitor how larger models were performing. I can't remember the discussion of that, but it was these smaller models were supposed to act sort of like as a supervision to the larger models. Then I just remember that Devin, a while back, that the coding assistant or the agent that's supposed to happen, I was, I'd be very curious if they are they've already added because is an open ai isn't that isn't devon officially sponsored by open ai or are they working with open ai i can't remember yeah i don't think there's a relationship there uh, devon was done by a company called cognitive yeah. yeah so but as we build out our agents is it is it responsible for us um just users or people who work with companies as we build these out to ensure that maybe, maybe it's a smart thing for us to do is to build an agent that reviews the agent. Mm -hmm. AI such a wild, wild west right at the beginning. And that Sam Ullman always said, Hey, we're going to release something. We just, there's no way you can test it in a closing where you have to put it out and see right. where it goes. So maybe one of the learnings would be, if we do have access to these agents, which I, I've always said the custom GBT is the agent. They're just missing a couple more features. But once that happens, 
would it be smart of us or even smart of OpenAI to build some sort of a critique G custom GPT that people can use to vet their agents through? So yeah. Well, I was, I was just going to say that this, this sounds or this looks like uh, a step towards that direction, mm -hmm. right? With Critic GPT. Uh, also, what's, what's interesting is because of, because of adding this, this other external agent and the way that it, it seems to, to, to function by either collaborating with, with human input and giving, um, cause there, there are some stats on there, like the, um, the, the reflections or the critiques it was outputting with, uh, with humans, uh, involved was more, uh, in depth and more descriptive and, you know, uh, was helping humans analyze the overall code better. They preferred it when it was both the critic GPT right. and, and the human input together. So that kind of leads me down the long, along the lines of this is one of those kinds of tools that uh, helps iterate, right? We, we know just, just chat GPT in general and LMs uh, help you cre through your creative process to iterate on ideas. But this could, this could be that, uh, that first step towards it being able to iterate uh, quickly for itself or as a component for an agent. Right. Mm -hmm. So when an agent is breaking down all of the steps that it needs to accomplish the overall goal, um, and part of that is is code building, then you have a separate AI or a separate model that can just iterate on the code over and over and over before it it accepts what the uh, what the results going to be or what it actually needs, uh, depending on whatever paths that it goes down. So this helps in in that autumn automation of that process for those agentic services. So one of the things that I was curious about when I was prepping for today's show was how this compares to Anthropic's approach. Because currently, Anthropic's Claude Sonnet 3.5 is a better code coder, right? Like that is winning in being able to create good code, execute good code, uh, learn from itself. And when I uh, when I had my conversation with Perplexity before the show, um, wh what uh, what what seemed to be true is that because Anthropic is a constitutional AI, they start from a place of being helpful and safe, and therefore they need less of the like oh no that's uh th that's down the wrong path that's going to be dangerous all that kind of stuff because that's from the base we're going to be helpful and we're going to be safe and i find it really interesting that that seems to be able to create really good results with smaller models um uh so i'm just curious uh, if anybody else has thought about that or what you think about it well i was Carl the 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 um the direction that I was thinking is, if you're going to have something like this, what else can you use it for? So I think initially it's like, oh, you know, we want to make sure about feedback and, and coding and stuff. But like, hey, what else could you use a critique GPT for that goes beyond something that we can create? Like a custom GPT that can critique a lot of things, right? Could it be? But then I started thinking about, wait a minute. So... We all know that OpenAI just bought Rockset, which is a real time. How I've always, how I've seen it, because I created a video that had to understand it, where there's real time data being input and there's real time indexing. So, and then being able to extract that real, that whole process in real time with the low latency, which is actually pretty remarkable how you would be able to do that. So, so wouldn't there be some sort of there would definitely need to be some sort of system to ensure that there's a check on that because that's a very right now what you have is you have fine tuning you have um a retrieval augmented generation or huge contacts windows one of those three is usually if you load data into but with something like rockset every single one of those three there still needs to be there's time that needs ingestion time, review time, 
you know, asking the query, it still has to analyze time. This thing apparently, apparently, as you're inputting the data, it can read the data and spit it back out as you're doing it. So there has to be something that you'd want to critique in there or put in there to ensure that, because I could see so many ways that the output is hallucinated. So many ways because of the amount of data that people will try to put in as fast as they can put in or as fast as possible because of different use cases. Right. And and then uh, now I want to say how much of the data is already hallucinated, right? How much of that, like, wow, you really get me. Uh, when actually you weren't listening at all, you were just saying like the four words that came after each other, right? How much of that is, ooh, Carl, <laughs> how much of reality is reality? Well, that's actually, anyway, we can go, that's a different <laughs> rat roll. I know. Separate exactly. show, guys, separate show. <laughs> uh, we can, we can <laughs> contemplate the holographic universe on the separate show. That's you were just asking for Star Trek. Yeah. Hey, here we go. I want to take a shot at answering a question that uh, Cisco put in the comments, which is, isn't QSTAR a necessary condition for effective agentic behavior? So this is, this is relevant, what he's mentioning here, because QSTAR is a model-free learning algorithm that allows an AI to basically figure out through experience what works and what doesn't. And that is uh, one of the uh, one of those for the predecessors of truly autonomous agents, which can actually provide a feedback system to themselves that optimizes their performance over time. So it's not a necessary condition because it, it, it but it's a sufficient condition, right? I mean, if you use QSTAR, that that will help you get to more complex and accurate you know, positive behaviors from an agent because you've implemented QSTAR as a feedback mechanism internally in that system uh, without having to have human feedback with RLHF, for example, to try to tune the performance of the model by giving it more and more positive examples. RLHF pipelines, as discussed early in the show, those are typically, here's, here's output one and here's output two. Which one is better? It's not like, get it exactly right. It's more about refining those and providing the better example to the model in the reward model that's attendant to that RLHF pipeline. So now this model is being trained with a lot of A-B pairs where it says, this one's not as good as this one. And that's all that the human feedback provider has to do is let's say, this one's better than that one. And that can feed into this RLHF thing. Now, you saw in the, uh, oh, we never showed it, but uh, in the uh, OpenAI announcement, they show what Critic GPT says about a block of code that was generated by Chat GPT 4. Okay, so Critic GPT says, ah, this step, whatever. <laughs> I'm not a coder. I, can, I, I couldn't uh, figure it out, but it's going much deeper than just you know, what a human can do, which is say, oh, of these two outputs, this one is better. It could also do that. But it's been trained with the ability to actually provide correction to one of those outputs. And that's an important step, I think. Definitely. And, and in, uh, in the way that we have talked about agents in the past, uh, like, you know, this is going to be your financial expert agent. This is going to be your marketing agent. This is going to be the agent that goes out and does those tasks. What we're talking about and the ability to like insert the corrections or even Carl as your um, a, as the information is being generated to analyze it and generate it again, like that kind of speed up. Uh, I'm now wondering, like, do our agents actually just little groupings of agents, right? Like, is the marketing agent that or the expert that we're going to ask to do this particular task, is that four kittens in a trench coat? Right. Like, are there are are there multiple functions within that that we call an agent um, because that's just easier for us? And it's going because agentic behavior is creating code for itself and then executing the code. 
is there automatically the critic GPT function within it to create code that's going to work and to create reasoning that's going to work and and all that kind of stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it could it could be a you have your orchestrator, right? You have your maestro who you uh, and you may even have uh, depending on how this is implemented is you could have your human interaction layer, right? That's you have your AI that uh, or your your tool, uh, you know, your AI tool that allows you that is specifically trained to understand what you're saying, right? What what is your meaning as a human, right? So that it it, it mitigates the amount of um, miscommunication there, and then that gets sent off to the orchestrator, who's like, okay, now here's all my Legos. Let's let's see what what we can build. All of these other AIs don't even need to exist until it it needs them and then it builds them right and then it puts them together in whatever combination and says okay you're going to be the best one to check my work you're going to be the best one to build the code and you're going to be the best one to go out and find that information and then goes off from there so i mean it, it it's just like when we talked about um like websites not needing to exist or is personalized personalized to your specific experience. So the the code or the tool doesn't exist until it needs to be built into uh until you request what the end result is or what the task is. So I that's the way I, I, I would look at it. Wow. Okay. Uh my mind is officially blown. <laughs> um what I am wondering now is how do we prepare for this? Like what is, what is, I'm a business person. I'm in a small business. Uh, I'm a small business owner. Um, what is my, why does this matter to me? What is my next step? Thoughts? Well, I think like when you talk about what a business owner should have in an ideal world, they would understand that the output of a of any large language model and especially ones that are trained on their specific data is still not 100 percent reliable and they there is a lot of work that still needs to be put in to ensure that the output is say 90 percent reliable then there'll still be a 10% that may not be reliable and you still have to work at it. Because I do have some clients that are like, hey, you know what? We can do this and we can just put it on and it'll just be a cost. And I was like, mm, you can't do that because it isn't just like any other tool. Like any other tool has a predictable output. And usually if the output is wrong, I would say 99% of the time, there's some sort of user error or we did the integrations well. There is some actual thing that happened. But with Gen AI, you'll have 10, 20%. For the life of us, we all know this. It just doesn't output what exactly you want. No matter how we prompted it, no matter how many examples, you're just like, why doesn't this do this correct? And it's getting better model by version by version because of the reasoning, but you're still going to have that. So it would be important for business owners to say, hey, I understand that. So I know understand that aspect and that fact, which then leads to, hey, this is an interesting concept because then it enables to check against the output. Now, if somebody, here's another million dollar idea. Is there something that can check the outputs of large language models in a way that it won't impact the output it can actually impact, like, it can check it. So think of Anthropic's constitutional model, right? There, There is, like, it checks before it replies, or when you provide a question, it checks against the constitution of what, you know, is based on the constitutional, I think, I forgot what it was called. Anthropic's, like, does it meet the certain criteria of being, you know, is it... Helpful. Yeah, helpful. Is it uh, non-biased? All those constitutional models before an output is created. 
So is there a way to do that? Not from a, not that type, but it's like checking it factually and then also being able to check it in real time um, through like doing an online search for this stuff, Mm -hmm. but also understanding if like the sources are legit sources. So there's like, to me, those are the two aspects. So if you can kind of understand those two points, I think you're well on your way, but at the moment, very, very few businesses can really grasp that very first point to begin with. Right. Right. I'll, I'll just reinforce what Carl said, which is for businesses, I think the good news is that These are techniques, we're discussing techniques today that are refining and improving the output of models so that they become more reliable and free of hallucinations, ultimately. Um, They will never be free of hallucinations. They they just have that tendency, even as humans do. You know, all of us have been involved with humans in the organization, uh, in any organization that you've been working with, who somehow get stuck on a on a certain idea and and you just can't displace it and it's clearly wrong to most observers in the room well <laughs> that that is frustrating but um we we don't then say okay well that person has no value uh you, you can't trust them ever again right it's just that, that you know those are what we mean by hallucination some generation that that, that gets stuck in, in a loop that, that doesn't work happens in neural networks in the brain and it also happens in these very deep neural networks, the trillion, trillion parameter networks that's going that you know we're working with right now. So good news, it, it, it's going to get better. Uh, it you know AI is at its worst right now <laughs> compared to what right. it will ultimately be. And these are the recursive, internally reinforcing, positive development loops that are being implemented by OpenAI and other companies to dramatically improve the reliability and performance of all the models. Awesome. Uh, Thank you so much. So one of the things that is important about this, if you are looking, uh, uh, if you are in a business and or uh, have um, some sort of professional responsibility is understanding the capabilities of AI today and what we're looking at in terms of the capabilities of AIs. Uh, as we move forward into the future. And two of the CEOs or experts um, uh, in the last couple weeks have come out. Dario Samade is one of them. What, was Mustafa Suleiman the other one who were talking about we need two more versions or two more iterations of uh, improvement before we're going to have fully autonomous AI agents? And the reason for that was accuracy. That when that yeah carl yes because it was Suleiman, and i think was it i don't know if it was hasabis or i think it was dario on a day two yeah it's still two more iterations right that's the assumption right and i think that falls in line with exactly um sam Altman's. remember that quote he had for it was a more of a marketing quote that ai will replace 95 percent of what creators right. do and then reinforced by Mira, like she, where she says these creatives weren't designed to be here, and the, like they shouldn't have been right in the first place. Uh, yeah, media <laughs> training, media training. <laughs> Good for her. It's it's <laughs> great. It's, but it comes out so authentic. But it's like, yeah, that's kind of where a, some a lot of people were thinking. But it just comes out. <laughs> that was like, right. like, that's great. Um. The I think though, they're right on like all the timelines are kind of all coalesced. They're all kind of speaking the same thing, you know, a couple years here or there. I'll I think like Andy, you would know this the best. A couple years isn't very long. Like as we all get older, the years get faster. So, you know, two years that'll go by so fast. We're looking 2026, 2027. Yeah. And remember the, um, who's the, I think it was the anthropic chief of staff that said, Hey, I'm trying to enjoy the next two years or so because all the stuff that, I be, that I'm working on will be taking over. 
that person doesn't just say that for the fun of it. That person has like, you know, knowledge of what's coming over the next two years. So, you know, it, uh, yeah, that's from a business perspective, it's such a slow wake up, but it's there. It's just percolating around the corner. It's around. Yeah. The corner. And I don't know, will it blow up just in like what happened here? I didn't know. And then we'll be in the situation. I, I don't know what kind of situation we'll be in. That's totally true. Cisco says she was chief human resources person at Anthropic. Thanks, yeah. Cisco, for the correction. Awesome. Uh, so I want to wrap up. We are at our 40 minute mark. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us for the show today. We are The Daily AI Show. You can find us at thedailyaishow.com. We publish a newsletter that uh, gives you a little recap of what we've talked about and uh, some more information about what we couldn't talk about on air. Not because it's bad, but because it's uh, it's uh, there's a lot. We always have more to say than we can say uh, in the time. Thanks specifically to Cisco, Justin, and Jen, and Dev, who uh, I believe came and left. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, and the people that we can't see, go ahead and like the broadcast and subscribe if you haven't yet. It really helps us out. Tomorrow is our news show. We will be talking about all the news that has been newsing in the last seven days. So we hope you will join us uh, there and uh, go ahead and check out more of the comments um, because there's a whole conversation going on there that uh, that we haven't been able to pull in. Um, thanks everybody so much and uh, we'll see you tomorrow we hope Aloha